Welcome back to the August 2013 version of the MNSRC podcast. This month we review a simple topic from a Major League Soccer game and a more complicated topic from youth footage. For Major League Soccer, we're going to take a look at the concept of the back pass, which some people will refer to as a pass back, in which a player passes the ball back to the goalkeeper. This is an indirect free kick offense if the goalkeeper picks the ball up with his hands, but we're going to talk about what makes it an offense, when the call should be made, what it should not be made, and when the call is made, how to handle the ensuing indirect free kick. Then, from our youth footage, we're going to look at the concept of using personality to handle players. This is more commonly utilized in adult matches, but we're going to look at some very simple youth clips and show you some basic concepts on how to not dig yourself into a hole. Our first clip this month comes from the July 12th game between the Philadelphia Union and Chivas USA at PPL Park in Chester, Pennsylvania. And we, we will try to find out more when we get an opportunity as this ball is played in and it's spilled by Kennedy. But he'll get it on the second try. Oh boy, what's the call there? A pass and, back. And a, yeah, but a bump there. There may be a red card coming. There was contact made. Soto, that's it for him. That's the second yellow. Foolish card. Foolish. He's done. I'm not sure whether Jorge Gonzalez gets this call right or not, but either way, once you get so many players around them, referees have a tough time keeping their cool, keeping their calm. All right, all set for this indirect free kick. The two's going to touch it. Someone else will take the shot, it looks like. And it's in there. That's a tough ball to get through. Michael Farfan. 2-1 Union. As the ball is played in by Fabinho. That's a tough one to call. But we talk about execution very calmly. Michael Farfan. Knowing that everybody's going to rush to the ball, able to flick it over the top of the on-rushing players. Very well done by Michael Farfan, showing... The first part of this somewhat complex situation boils down to a very simple decision. Did an infraction occur? The ball deflects from the Chivas goalkeeper, Dan Kennedy, into the middle of the penalty area where a Philadelphia attacker and a Chivas defender contest the ball. The ball pops out of the 50-50 challenge towards Kennedy, who picks it up. The referee blows his whistle and calls a Law 12 violation on Kennedy for handling the ball from a ball intentionally kicked directly to him by a teammate. Notice the referee raises his arm straight up to indicate the restart will be an indirect free kick. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to refer to this infraction as a back pass, understanding that many people call it different things. In order for a back pass to be called, three things have to happen. One, the ball must be kicked, not headed, not kneed, not chest trapped, but kicked by foot from an outfield defender. Two, the ball must deliberately be played to the goalkeeper with no intervening touches. The key word here is deliberate. The referee must be of the opinion that the ball was purposely played by foot from a defender to deliver the ball to the goalkeeper. Three, the goalkeeper must pick the ball up with his or her hands prior to any touch by any other player. If any of these three things are not present, then no violation can occur. So as we watch this clip, ask yourself, is any of these three things missing? The ball was clearly kicked by defender Josue Soto. The ball did not touch any other players en route to back to Kennedy, who picked it up with his hands, two out of two. But was the ball played deliberately by Soto to Kennedy? Eh, that's a reach. Here's the thing in the back pass call. If you're going to call it, you should have absolutely no doubt that the ball was played to the goalkeeper on purpose. It certainly appears that the referee has no doubt, but my guess is that 9 out of 10 people who watch this would say there's plenty of doubt. Pro even commented on this in their play of the week, stating that in their opinion, quote, this was not a deliberate pass. Therefore, this should not have resulted in a call. There are two further interesting components of this clip, however. 
just because the referee made a mistake, and just because he happened to make this mistake with 11 minutes to go in a 1-1 game, does not justify the response of the Chivas team. Soto immediately bumps the referee as he argues the call, and the referee gives him a yellow card, his second, in fact, so he is sent off. The aggressive posturing of Soto, combined with the contact made with the referee, could warrant a straight red card for violent conduct. Soto's teammate, Eric Avila, was also very fortunate to not be cautioned or sent off when he touched the referee after Soto's booking, though, in Avila's defense, his contact was not aggressive in nature. The surrounding of the referee by five or six Chivas players is a mass confrontation situation, not the traditional one where players aggressively confront one another, but rather one in which players surround the referee in an attempt to influence him. Chivas was fined by the league for their team's behavior in this situation. We bring up these points because a. You should never hesitate to use misconduct to punish aggressive contact from players directed towards you as a referee, and b. You should always report any incident of mass confrontation when three or more players from one team surround you in an attempt to influence or argue a call. You don't need to pull a card on mass confrontation that is directed at the referee. In fact, that may be a really bad idea. Just Google the keywords Brazil, referee, and attack, and you'll probably find something both entertaining and educational. But you do need to report the incident in a match report so that the governing body can take action against the team guilty of the mass confrontation. The referee's response in this situation was the correct one, even if his original call was incorrect. Also worth noting is a reminder that in any mass confrontation situation, regardless of whether it's player versus player or player versus referee, the assistant referee should move off the line and come in to help out. In this situation, the assistant could run interference and keep players from following the referee, preventing further misconduct. The other element that we need to discuss is the ensuing indirect free kick. Notice the kick is taken from about a yard outside the goal area. This is correct. An indirect free kick can be taken from anywhere on the field except in the attacking goal area. Many people forget that the attacking team can be awarded an indirect free kick inside the defending team's penalty area. The attacking team has the right to take this free kick quickly, and a smart player will do so. In this case, due to the yellow card, this free kick had to be ceremonial, meaning that all aspects of Law 13 must be enforced before the referee could allow the kick to proceed. Normally, the defense must yield 10 yards, but on an indirect free kick closer to the goal than 10 yards, the defenders are permitted to stand within 10 yards of the ball on the condition that they are on the goal line and between the goal posts. The referee certainly tried to line the Chivas defenders up here, but he unfortunately didn't impose himself well on this situation, and at least three defenders, including the goalkeeper, are off the line. This could have wound up being a problem. It is very important as a referee to demand the appropriate positioning of the defenders in this situation. When the referee blows the whistle, the attacker over the ball complains about the defenders that are off the goal line. We see the referee point at the defenders, possibly saying something. At this point, the referee has interfered with the defender's assumption that the kick can proceed. Once he decides to get involved again, the kick should be held up. The referee could simply reset the defenders, or he could caution one of them for failing to respect the required distance. If you do caution a player here, you only caution one player, and pay close attention to who might be sitting on a yellow card when you do this. A good referee will not give a second caution and send somebody off for failure to respect the required distance when there is another player that can be cautioned that is not sitting on a card. Of course, another caution to Chivas after the referee just sent somebody off for response to a crucial and controversial decision at this stage of a tie game probably would not be advisable here. Either way, at this point, once he gets involved, the free kick should be halted. Instead, he allows it to proceed and Philadelphia converts from a difficult restart to take the lead 2-1. to one. In this rare and often controversial situation, it is absolutely crucial for the referee to take as much time as needed to make sure that the defenders are properly positioned first. All in all, this entire situation, from the decision to award the indirect free kick to the management of the restart, could have been handled better. This is an excellent referee who made some eyebrow-raising decisions at a crucial stage of a close match. It happens to all of us at some point. 
It's a tremendous learning opportunity nonetheless, involving a rare situation that most referees have probably never encountered in their own games. Our MYSA clips this month examine a subtle but important part of player management using your personality. Watch how this referee handles this situation in a U11 game. So the white player commits a hard challenge from behind on the blue player. The referee has the foul, but invariably the victim of fouls like these won't be particularly pleased with what happened. We don't see how the blue player responds, but the referee shows great presence. He's at the site of the foul immediately and repeatedly says to the foul player, I've got it, I've got it. This is excellent work because he's telling the victim of the foul in ref speak, don't do or say anything stupid, I'm going to take care of him, yes, that was a bad foul, let me deal with it. This quickly diffuses the possibility that the blue player will commit misconduct in response to being fouled. We'd like to ask all of you to put yourself in the shoes of the victim of fouls. It's no fun to get kicked, tripped, charged, pushed, and so on. After a while, even a referee whistle or perhaps even a card may still not feel like enough when an opposing player is using you and your team like a punching bag. So it's important for referees to empathize with the victims of fouls and make sure they understand that we understand they have good reason to be upset. Not good reason to take matters into their own hands, but reason to be upset. Our one critique of this referee here would be that he should go back later and make sure he says something else to the foul victim. Think about it. You just got hacked, you're a little peeved, and now the referee's yelling at you? There might be a slight sense of injustice, which can lead to some simmering and perhaps physical retribution against the perpetrator later. So in addition to assuring the fouled player that, quote, I've got it, it's a good idea to come back later to him and say something else in private just to take the edge off. Hey, I'll protect you. That was a bad foul. Please just let me take care of it. Now, watch this clip. In this boys U17 game, the white player commits a bad foul which upsets the black player. The referee did not call the foul or show any urgency on a play where the white player sticks his studs into the black player's thigh. Players will read this and begin to develop a need to provide their own justice when this lack of urgency is present. The referee takes a long time to talk to the white player and upon finishing then turns to the black player and audibly tells him to shut up. Again, put yourself in the shoes of the player here. I just got cleated in the midsection. I'm going to be a bit annoyed. You have this stern conversation with the hacker, and then you turn around and tell me to shut up? Does that seem fair? There's nothing wrong with taking care of a foul victim who is chirping. In fact, we have to do this so we make sure the situation doesn't turn into game disrepute, and we need to calm the victim down. But we need to be careful and think about how we go about doing that. If you're walking down the street and somebody clocks you and the police arrive and tell you, quit whining, it's just a flesh wound, what's your perception of the police officer? Well, that's how players feel. Remember to show empathy and think about the words that we use to calm down victims of fouls. They deserve our support, not lectures. That concludes our topics for August. We'll be back in October.